Chapters 3 and 4 of And Then the Town Took Off by Richard Wilson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter 3 Much of the rest of the world was inclined to regard the elevation of Superior, Ohio, as a Fortean phenomenon in the same category as flying saucers and sea monsters. The press had a field day. Most of the headlines were whimsical. Town takes off. Superior lives up to name. A rising community. The City Council of Superior, Wisconsin, passed a resolution urging its Ohio namesake to come back down. The Superiors in Nebraska, Wyoming, Arizona, and West Virginia, glad to have the publicity, added their voices to the plea. The Pennsylvania Railroad filed a suit demanding that the state of Ohio return forthwith one train and five miles of right-of-way. The price of bubblegum went up from one cent to three for a nickel. In Parliament a Labour member rose to ask the Home Secretary for assurances that all British cities were firmly fastened down. An Ohio waterworks put in a bid for the sixteen square miles of hole that Superior had left behind, explaining that it would make a fine reservoir. A company that leased out big advertising signs in Times Square offered Superior a quarter of a million dollars for exclusive rights to advertising space on its bottom or earthward side. It sent the offer by air mail, leaving delivery up to the post office. In Washington, Senator Bobby Thebold ascertained that his red-haired secretary, Jen Jervis, had been aboard the train levitated with Superior and registered a series of complaints by telephone starting with the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Railroad Brotherhoods. He asked the FBI to investigate the possibility of kidnapping and muttered about the likelihood of it all being a communist plot. A little-known congressman from Ohio started a rumor that raising a superior was an experiment connected with the United States Earth Satellite Program. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration issued a quick denial. Two men talked earnestly in an efficient-looking room at the end of one of the more intricate mazes in the Pentagon building. Neither wore a uniform, but the younger man called the other sir or chief or general. "'We've definitely established that Sergeant Court was on that train, have we?' the general asked. "'Yes, sir, no doubt about it.' "'And he has the item with him?' "'He must have.' The only keys are here and at the other end. He couldn't open the handcuff or the briefcase. The only known keys, that is. Oh, how's that, General? The sergeant can open the briefcase and use the item if we tell him how. You think it's time to use it? I thought we were saving it. That was before Superior defected. Now we can use it to more advantage than any theoretical use it might be put to in the foreseeable future. We could evacuate Court, take him off in a helicopter, or drop him a parachute and let him jump. No. Having him there is a piece of luck. No one knows who he is. We'll assign him there for the duration and have him report regularly. Let's go to the message center. Senator Bobby Thebold was an imposing six foot two, a muscular one ninety five, a youthful looking forty three. He wore his steel-gray hair cut short, and his skin was tan the year round. He was a bachelor. He had been a fighter pilot in World War II, and his conversation was peppered with Air Force slang, much of it out of date. Thebold was good newspaper copy, and one segment of the press, admiring his fighting ways, had dubbed him Bobby the Bold. The senator did not mind a bit. At the moment, Senator Thebold was pacing the carpet in the ample working space he'd fought to acquire in the Senate office building. He was momentarily at a loss. His inquiries about Jen Jervis had elicited no satisfaction from the ICC, the FBI, or the CIA. He was in an alphabetical train of thought and went on to consider the CAA, the CAB, and the CAP. He snapped his fingers at CAP. He had it. The Civil Air Patrol itself he considered a la di da outfit of gentlemen flyers, skittering around in light planes, admittedly doing some good, 
but by and large nothing to excite a former P-38 pilot who'd won a chestful of ribbons for action in the Southwest Pacific. Ah, but the P.P. There was an organization. Bobby Thebold had been one of the founders of the private pilots, a hard-flying outfit that zoomed into the wild blue yonder on weekends and holidays, engines a-roar, propellers a-glint, white silk scarfs a-flap. P.P.'s members were wealthy industrialists, stunt flyers, sportsmen, the elite of the air. P.P. was a paramilitary organization with the rank of its officers patterned after the Royal Air Force. Thus Bobby Thebold, by virtue of his war record, his charter membership, and his national eminence, was Wing Commander Thebold, D.F.C. Wing Commander Thebold swung into action. He barked into the telecom. Miss Riley, get the airport. Have them rev up charger. Tell them I'll be there for 0958 takeoff. Ten hundred will do, and get my car. Charger was Bobby the Bold's war surplus P-38 Lightning, a sleek, twin-boomed, two-engined fighter plane restored to its gleaming paintless aluminum. Actually, it was an unarmed photo-reconnaissance version of the famous war horse of the Pacific, a fact the wing commander preferred to ignore. In compensation he belted on a forty-five whenever he climbed into the cockpit. Thebold got on to operations in P.P.'s Midwestern headquarters in Chicago. He barked long distance. Jack Purley? Group Captain Purley, that is? Bobby, that's right. Wing Commander Thebold now. We've got a mission, Jack. Scramble Blue Squadron. What? Of course you can. This is an emergency. We'll rendezvous north of Columbus. I'll give you the exact grid in half an hour when I'm airborne. Can do? Good o. ETA? 11.20 EST. Well, maybe that is optimistic, but I hate to see the day slipping by. Make it 11.45. What? Objective? Objective superior. Got it? Okay, Roger. Wing Commander Bobby Thebold took his Lindbergh-style helmet and goggles from a desk drawer, caressing the lint leather fondly and put them in a dispatch case. He gave a soft salute to the door behind which Jen Jervis customarily worked, more as his second-in-command than his secretary, and said half aloud, "'Okay, Jen, we're coming to get you.' He didn't know quite how, but Bobby the Bold and Charger would soon be on their way. Don Cork regretfully detached himself from Alice Garrett. "'What was that?' he said. That was me, Alice the Love Star. You could be a bit more gallant. Even how was that, though corny would have been preferable. No, I mean, I thought I heard a voice. Didn't you hear anything? To be perfectly frank, and I will say it was some peak, I was totally absorbed. Obviously you weren't. It was very nice. The countryside from the edge to the golf course was deserted. Well, thanks, thanks a bunch. Such enthusiasm is more than I can bear. I have to go now. There's an eleven o'clock class in magnetic flux that I am simply dying to audit. She gave her shoulder-length blonde hair a toss and started back. Don hesitated, looked suspiciously at the briefcase dangling from his wrist, shook his head, then followed her. The voice, wherever it came from, had not spoken again. Don't be angry, Alice. He fell into step on her left and took her arm with his free hand. It's just that everything is so crazy and nobody seems to be taking it seriously. A town doesn't just get up and take off, and yet nobody up here seems terribly concerned. Alice squeezed the hand that held her arm, mollified. You've got lipstick on your whiskers. Good, I'll never shave again. Ah, she laughed, gallantry at last. I tell you what let's do. We'll go see Ed Clark, the editor of the Sentry. Maybe he'll give you some intelligent conversation. The newspaper office was in a ramshackle one-story building on Lyric Avenue, a block off Broadway, Superior's main street. It was in an ordinary storefront whose windows displayed various ancient stand-up cardboard posters calling attention to a church supper, a state fair, an auto race, and a movie starring H.B. Warner. A dust-covered banner urged the election as president of Alfred E. Smith. There was no one in the front of the shop. 
Alice led Don to the rear where a tall, skinny man with straggly gray hair was setting type. "'Good morning, Mr. Clark,' she said. "'What's that you're setting, an anti-Hoover handbill?' "'Hello, Al. How are you this fine altitude in this day?' "'Super, or should it be Supra? I want you to meet Don Cort. Don, Mr. Clark.' The men shook hands, and Clark looked curiously at Don's handcuff. "'It's my theory he's an embezzler,' Alice said, "'and he's made this his getaway town.' "'As a matter of fact,' Don said, "'the Riggs National Bank will be worried if I don't get in touch with them soon. I guess you'd know, Mr. Clark. Is there any communication at all out of town?' By prearrangement, a message from Don to Riggs would be forwarded to military intelligence. "'I don't know of any except for the civic method, a bottle tossed over the edge. The telegraph and telephone lines are cut, of course. There is a radio station in town, WCAV, operated from the campus, but it's been silent ever since the Great Severance. At least nothing local has come over my old Atwater Kent.' "'Isn't anybody doing anything?' Don asked. Sure, Clark said. I'm getting out my paper. There was even an extra this morning, and doing job printing. The job is for a jeweler in Ladenburg. I don't know how I'll deliver it, but no one's told me to stop, so I'm doing it. I guess everybody's carrying on pretty much as before. That's what I mean. Business as usual. But how about the people who do business out of town? What's Western Union doing, for instance? and the trucking companies, and the factories. You have two factories, I understand, and pretty soon there's going to be a mighty big surplus of kitchen sinks and chewing gum. You two go on settling our fate, Alice said. I'd better get back to school. Look me up later, Don. She waved and went out. Fine girl, that Alice, Clark said. Got her old man's gumption without his nutty streak. To answer your question, the Western Union man here is catching up on his bookkeeping and accepting outgoing messages contingent on restoration of service. The sink factory made a shipment two days ago and won't have another ready till next week, so they're carrying on. They have enough raw material for a month. I was planning to visit the bubblegum people this afternoon to see how they're doing. Maybe you'd like to come. Yes, I would. I still chew it once in a while on the sly. Clark grinned. I won't tell. Would you like to tidy up, Don? There's a washroom out back with a razor and some mysterious running water. Now there's a phenomenon I'd like to get to the bottom of. Thanks, I'll shave with it now and worry about its source later. Do you think Professor Garrett and his magnology cult has anything to do with it? He'd like to think so, I'm sure, Clark shrugged. We've been airborne less than twelve hours. I guess the answers will come in time. You go clean up and I'll get back to my job. Don felt better when he had shaved. It had been awkward because he hadn't been able to take off his coat or shirt, but he'd managed. He was drying his face when the voice came again. This time there was no doubt it came from the briefcase chained to his handcuff. "'Are you alone now?' it asked. "'Startled,' Don said. "'Yes.' "'Good. Speak closer to the briefcase so we won't be overheard. This is Captain Simmons, Sergeant.' "'Yes, sir.' Take out your ID card. Separate the two pieces of plastic. There's a flat plastic key next to the card. Open the briefcase lock with it. The voice was silent until Don, with the help of a razor blade, had done as he was directed. All right, sir, that's done. Open the briefcase, take out the package, open the package, and put the wrappings back in the briefcase. Again the voice stopped. Don unwrapped something that looked like a flat cigarette case with two appendages, one a disc of perforated hard rubber the size of a half dollar, and the other a three-quarter inch wide ribbon of opaque plastic. I've got it, sir. Good. What you see is a highly advanced radio transmitter and receiver. You can imagine its value in the field. It's a pilot model you were bringing back from the contractor for tests here, but this seems as useful a way to test it as any other. Its range is fantastic, Captain, if you're in Washington. I am. Now, the key also unlocks the handcuff. Unlock it. Strip to the waist, bend the plastic strip to fit over your shoulder, either one as you choose. Arrange the perforated disc so it's at the base of your neck, under your shirt collar. 
the thing that looks like a cigarette case, is the power pack. Don followed the instructions, rubbing his wrist in relief as the handcuff came off. The radio had been well designed, and its components went into place as if they'd been built to his measure. They tickled a little on his bare skin, that was all. The power pack was surprisingly light. "'That's done, sir,' Don said. The answer came softly. "'So I hear. You almost blasted my ear off. From now on when you speak to me or whoever's at this end, a barely audible murmur will be sufficient. Try it.' "'Yes, sir,' Don whispered. "'I'm trying it now. Don't whisper. I can hear you all right, but so could people you wouldn't want overhearing at your end. A whisper carries further than you think. Talk low.' Don practiced while he put his shirt, tie, and coat pack on. Good, Captain Simmons said. Practice talking without moving your lips, for occasions when you might have to transmit to us in someone's view. Now, put your handcuff back on and lock it. Oh, damn, Don said under his breath. I heard that. Sorry, sir, but it is a nuisance. I know, but you have to get rid of it logically. When you get a chance, go to the local bank. It's the Superior State Bank on McEntee Street. Show them your credentials from Riggs National and ask them to keep your briefcase in their vault. Get a receipt. Then, at your first opportunity, burn the plastic key in your ID card. Yes, sir. Keep up your masquerade as a bank messenger and try to find out, as if you were an ordinary curiosity seeker, all you can about Cavalier Institute. You've made a good start with the Garrett girl. Get to know her father, the professor. Yes, sir. Don realized with embarrassment that his little romantic interlude with Alice must have been eavesdropped on. Are there any particular times I'm to report? You will be reporting constantly. That's the beauty of this radio. You mean I can't turn it off? I won't have any privacy? There'll always be somebody listening? Exactly, but you mustn't be inhibited. Your private life is still your own, and no one will criticize. Your unofficial actions will simply be ignored. Oh, great. You must rely on our discretion, Sergeant. I'm sure you'll get used to it. Enough of this for now. We mustn't excite Clark's suspicions. Go back to him now and carry on. You'll receive further instructions as they are necessary. And remember, don't be inhibited. No, sir, Don said ruefully. He went back to the print shop feeling like a goldfish bowl. Chapter 4 Ed Clark took Don to the Superior State Bank and introduced him to the President, who was delighted to do business with a representative of Riggs National of Washington, D.C. Don told him nothing about the contents of the briefcase, but the banker seemed to be under the impression they were securities, or maybe even a million dollars cash, and Don said nothing to spoil his pleasure. Outside again, with the receipt in his wallet, Don stood with Clark on the corner of McEntee Street and Broadway. This is the heart of town, you might say, the newspaper editor said. The bubblegum factory is over that way on the railroad spur. Maybe you can smell it. Smells real nice, I think. Don rubbed the wrist that had been manacled for so long. He was sniffing politely when there was a roar of engines and a squadron of fighter planes buzzed Broadway. They screamed over at little more than roof level, then they were gone. They were overhead so briefly that Don noticed only that they were P-38s, at least four of them. Things are beginning to happen, Don said. The Air Force is having a look-see. Clark shook his head. That wasn't the Air Force. Those were the PP boys. They're the only ones who fly those lightnings these days. PP? Private pilots. Bobby the Bold's airborne vigilantes. Wonder what they're up to. Oh, Senator Bobby Thebold. S.O.B. If you want to put it that way, yes. It's a private joke, but I think I know what they're up to, or why. The senator's secretary is marooned up here like me. She was on the train, too. You don't say. I got scooped on that one. Which one is she? The redhead, Geneva Jervis. I haven't seen her since last night, come to think of it. The P-38s screamed over again, this time from west to east. Don counted six planes now and made out the PP markings. People had come out of stores and business buildings and were looking out of upstairs windows at the sky. 
they were rewarded by a third thundering fly-past of the fighter planes. They were higher this time, spread out laterally as if to search maximum terrain. Big deal, Clark said. This show would bring anyone outdoors, but even if they see her, what do you suppose they can do about it? There's no place in town flat enough for a Piper Cub to land, let alone a fighter plane. How about the golf course? Brawley, we're set of links in the whole United States. A helicopter could put down there, but that's about all. What's old Bobby so worked up about, I wonder? Unless there's something to that gossip about this Jervis girl being his mistress, and he's showing off for her. He'd show off for anybody, they tell me, Don said. Then he remembered that military intelligence was listening in. If any pro Thebold people were among his eavesdroppers, he'd hoped they respected his private right to be anti Thebold. At that moment he and Clark were thrown against the side of the bank building. They clung to each other, and Don noticed that the sun had moved a few degrees in the sky. Uh oh, Clark grunted. Superior's taking evasive action. Thinks it's being attacked and as they regained their footing he asked, "'Do you feel heavy in the legs?' "'Yes, as if I were going up in an express elevator.' "'Exactly. Somebody's getting us up beyond the reach of these pesky planes, I guess.' The P-38s were overhead again, but now they seemed to be diving on the town. More likely, if Clark's theory was right, it was an illusion. The planes were flying level, but the town was rising fast.' They better climb, Don said, or they'll crash. There was a sound of a crash almost immediately from the south end of town. Don and Clark ran toward it, fighting the heaviness in their legs. A dozen others were ahead of them, running sluggishly across South Creek Bridge. Beyond, just short of the edge, was the wreckage of a fighter plane, and behind it the torn-up ground of a crash landing. There was no fire. The pilot struggled out of the cockpit. He dropped to the ground, felt himself to see if any bones were broken, then saw the crowd running toward him. The pilot hesitated, then ran toward the edge. Shouts came from the crowd. With a last glance over his shoulder, the pilot leaped and went over the edge. The crowd, Don and Clark among them, approached more cautiously. They made out a falling dot, and a second later saw a parachute blossom open. The other planes appeared and flew a wide protective circle around the shooters. "'Do you think that's Bobby Thebold?' Don asked. "'Probably not. That was the last plane in the formation. Thebold would be the leader.' They went back past the crashed plane, surrounded by a growing crowd from town, and recrossed the bridge. "'Look at the water,' the editor said. "'Ice is forming.' "'And we're still rising,' Don said, "'if my legs are any judge. Do you think there's a connection?' Clark shrugged. He turned up his coat collar and rubbed his hands. All I know is the higher we go, the colder we get. Come on back to the shop and warm up. They turned at the sound of engines. Two of the five remaining P-38s had detached themselves from their cover of the chutes and were flying around the rim of Superior, as if unwilling to risk another flight across the surface of the town that seemed determined to become a satellite of Earth. When Don Court reached the campus, he was shivering in spite of the sweater and topcoat Ed Clark had lent him. He asked a student where the administration building was, and at the desk inquired for Professor Garrett. A gray-haired, dedicated-looking woman told him impatiently that Professor Garrett was in his laboratory and couldn't be disturbed. She wouldn't tell him where the laboratory was. "'Have you seen Miss Jervis?' Don wondered whether the redhead appreciated the demonstration her boss, the flying senator, had put on for her. The woman behind the desk shook her head. "'You're two of the people from the train, aren't you? Well, you're all supposed to report to the dining room at two o'clock.' "'What for?' "'You'll find out at two o'clock.' It was obvious he would get no more information from her. Don left the building. It was half-past one. He crossed the near-deserted campus. His legs still felt heavy, and he assumed Superior was still rising. It certainly seemed to be getting increasingly colder. He wondered how high they were and whether it would snow. He hoped not. How high did you have to be before you got up to where it didn't snow any more? He had no idea. 
He did recall that Mount Everest was 29,000 feet up and that it snowed up there. Or would it be down there, relatively speaking? How high could they be? And didn't anybody care? The frosty old receptionist seemed to be typical in her business-as-usual, come-what-may attitude. Even Ed Clark didn't seem as concerned as he ought to be about Superior's ascent into the stratosphere. Clark was interested, certainly, but he'd given Don the impression that he was no more curious than he would be about any other phenomena he'd write about in next week's paper, a two-headed calf, for instance. Don remembered now that the conquerors of Everest had needed oxygen in the rarefied atmosphere near the summit, and he experimentally took a couple of deep breaths. No difficulty. Therefore they weren't 29,000 feet up. Yet. Small comfort, he thought, as he shivered again. He picked out a building at random. Classes were in session behind the closed but windowed doors along the hall. From the third door he saw Alice Garrett sitting at the back of a small classroom. Her attention had wandered from the instructor, and when she saw Don she smiled and beckoned. He hesitated, then opened the door, and went in as quietly as he could. The instructor paused briefly, nodded, then went back to a droning lecture. It seemed to be an English literature class. Alice cleared some books off a chair next to her, and Don sat down. "'Who turned you loose?' she whispered. He realized she was referring to his de-handcuffed wrist and grinned, indicating that he'd tell her later. "'I see you've been outfitted for our new climate,' she went on. A student in the row of chairs ahead turned and frowned. The instructor talked on, oblivious. Don nodded and said, "'Shh! Don't let them intimidate you. Did you see the planes?' More students were turning and glaring, and Don's embarrassment grew. Come on, he said, let's cut this class. Bravo, she said, spoken like a true cavalier. She gathered up her books. The instructor, without interrupting his lecture, followed them with his eyes as they left the room. Now I'll never know whether the young princess got out of the tower alive, she said. They didn't. The question is, will we? I certainly hope so. I'll have to speak to father about it. He's locked up in his lab, they tell me. Where would that be? in the tower, as a matter of fact, the bell tower that the founding fathers built and then didn't have enough money to buy bells for. But you can't go up there. It's the holy of holies. Can you? No, why? You don't think father is making all this happen, do you? Somebody is. Professor Garrett seems as good a suspect as any. Oh, he likes to act mysterious, but it's all an act. Poor old father is just a crackpot theorist. I told you that. He couldn't pick up steel filing with a magnet. I wonder. Look, somebody's called a meeting for us outsiders from the train at two o'clock. It's almost that now. Maybe I'll have a chance to ask some questions. Will your father be there? I'm sure he will. He's a great meeting caller. I'll go with you. And since you have two free hands now, you can hold my books. Maybe later you'll get a chance to hold me. Among the people sitting around the bare tables in the dining room, Don recognized the conductor and other trainmen, two stocky individuals who had the look of traveling salesmen, an elderly couple who held hands, a young couple with a baby, two nuns, a soldier apparently going on or returning from furlough, and a tall hawk-nosed man Don classified on no evidence at all as a Shakespearean actor. All had been on the train. He didn't see Geneva Jervis anywhere. An improvised speaker's table had been set up at one end of the room, near the door to the kitchen. A heavy-set man sat at the table talking to Mrs. Garrett, the professor's wife. The stoutish gentleman next to Mother is the president of Cavalier, Alice said. Maynard Rubach. When you talk to him be sure to call him Dr. Rubach. He's not a Ph.D., and he's sensitive about it, but he did used to be a veterinarian. They sat down near the big table, and Mrs. Garrett smiled and waved at them. Mayor Civic came in through the kitchen door, licking a finger as if he'd been sampling something on the way, and sat down to Mrs. Garrett. At that moment Don's stomach gave a hop, and he felt blood rushing to his head. Others also had pained or nauseous expressions. Ugh, Alice said. Now what? 
I guess, Don said, when his stomach had settled back in place, that we've stopped rising. You mean we've gone as high as we're going to go? I hope so. We'll run out of air if we went much higher. Professor Garrett came in presently, looking pleased with himself. He nodded to his wife and the men next to her, and cleared his throat as he looked out over the room. Altitude 21,500 feet, he announced without preamble. Temperature 16 degrees Fahrenheit. From here on out, he paused, repeated, out, and chuckled, it's going to be a bit chilly. Those of you who are inadequately clothed will see my wife for extra garments. I believe you have been comfortably housed and fed. There will, of course, be no charge for these services while you are the guest of the Cavalier Institute of Applied Sciences. Thank you. I now present Mr. Hector Civic, the Mayor of Superior, who will answer any other questions you may have. Don looked at Alice, who shrugged. The conductor stood and opened a notebook which he consulted. I have a few questions, Mr. Mayor. These people have asked me to speak for them, and there's one question that outweighs all the others. That is, are you going to take us back to Earth? If so, when and how? Civic cleared his throat. He took a sip of water. As for the first question, we certainly hope to take you and ourselves back to Earth. I can't answer the others. You hope to? Earnestly. I turned blue easily myself, and I'm as anxious as you are to get back. But when that will be depends entirely on circumstances. Circumstances, uh, beyond my control. Who's controlling them, then? Your friend with the whiskers? Professor Garrett smiled amiably and patted his beard. The portly Maynard Rubach got up and Civic sat down. I am Dr. Maynard Rubach, President of Cavalier. I must insist that, in common decency, we all refrain from personal references. Mr. Civic has done his best to give you an explanation, but of course he is a layman, and while he has many excellent qualities, we cannot expect him to be conversant with the principles of science. I will therefore attempt to explain. As you know, science has been aware for hundreds of years that the earth is a giant magnet. Don saw Geneva Jervis. She was at the kitchen door beyond the speaker's table. The isogenic and the isoclinic. The red-haired Miss Jervis saw Don now and put her finger to her lips. An ultimote, which is simultaneously an integral part of... Now the redhead was beckoning to him urgently. He excused himself to Alice, who frowned when she saw the other girl. Then he went back to the speaker's table. One thousand two hundred and fifty-seven telescopes to the square centimeter. Into the kitchen. Jen Jervis was by now at the far end of it, motioning him to hurry up. I found something, she said. She was wearing a shapeless fur coat, apparently borrowed. Come on, you'll have to see it. All right, but why me? Aside from myself, you seem to be the only one from the train with any gumption. I know you've been spying around, doing things while everybody else sat back and waited for deliverance. Though I can't say I admire your choice of companions. That tawdry blonde. Now really, Miss Jervis. Tawny, then. Sometimes I mix up my words. I'll bet. She led him out the back door and across the frozen ground past several buildings. They reached what once must have been an athletic field. At the far end, she said, come on. Where were you when your boyfriend and his daredevil aces came over? I saw them. Did they see you? None of your business. He shrugged. They were at a section of the grandstand at the end of the field. Jen Jervis indicated a door, and Don opened it. It led to a big room under the stands. What does this remind you of? she asked. Don looked blank. In the dim light he could see some planking, a long deflated football, ancient peanut shells, and an empty pint bottle. I don't know. What? Stag Field? At the University of Chicago? Under the stands where they first made an atomic pile work. She looked at him with the air of an investigator, hot on the scent. He shrugged. Never been there, so what? It's a pattern. This is where they've hidden their secret. It looks more like the place a co-ed and her boyfriend might go to have a little fun. In warmer weather, of course. Oh, she said, you're disgusting. 
Look over there. He looked, wondering what made this young, attractive woman hypersensitive on the subject of sex. This was the second time she'd blazed up over nothing. What he saw where she pointed was a door at a forty-five degree angle to the ground set into a triangular block of concrete. Where does that go? he asked. Down, she said as they walked toward it. And there's some machinery or something down there. I heard it. Or maybe I only felt the vibration. It throbs anyway. Probably the generator for the school's lighting system. Did you go down and look? No. All right, then. He opened the door. Down we go. At the bottom of a flight of steps there was a corridor lit by dim electric light bulbs along one wall. The corridor became a tunnel sloping gradually downward. They had been going north, Don judged, but then the tunnel made a right turn, and now they were following it due east. I don't hear any throbbing, he said. Well, I did, and from way up here. They must have turned it off. How long ago was that? An hour, maybe. While we were still rising, that would make sense. We stopped again, you know. Professor Garrett gave us a bulletin on it. He had been going ahead of her in the narrow tunnel. Now it widened and they were able to walk side by side. There seemed to be no end to it. But then they came to a sturdy-looking door, padlocked. That's that, Don said. That's that nothing, she said. Break it down. He laughed. You flatter me. Come on back. Don't you think this is at all peculiar? A tunnel starting under an abandoned grandstand, running all this way, and ending in a locked door? Maybe this was a station on the underground railway. It looks old enough. We're going through that door. She opened her purse and took out a key ring. On it was an extensive collection of keys. Eventually she found one that opened the padlock. Well, he said, who taught you that? Open the door. The corridor beyond the door was lined, walls, ceiling, and floor with a silvery metal. It continued east a hundred yards or so, swung north, and then went east again, widening all the time. It ended in a great room whose far wall was glass or some equally transparent substance. The room was a huge observatory at the end of Superior, but below its rim. They could look down from it, not without a touch of nausea, to the earth four miles below. Don, thinking of the surface of Superior above, thought it was as if they were looking out of a gondola slung beneath a dirigible, or from one of the lower portholes in a giant flying saucer. End of chapter four. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com.